in these moments, these unseen, uncelebrated, silent moments, ground is taken, battles are won, life is formed. Through the seemingly insignificant times, what you stand on is discovered, who you are is developed, and what you believe is shaped. Men, fathers, friends, husbands are made. In the shadows, backstage, before the sunrise, in your soul, this is where you win. Hope is found in these moments. Meaning is made in the stand. Stand and fight the good fight of the faith. Welcome to Life Church. I'm so glad that you joined with us. We really pray that this message today will make a difference in your world. I am gonna begin a message tonight. I began it this morning. I'll start from the beginning. Hopefully I'll complete it tonight because I didn't get to complete it this morning. But also I wanna leave room at the end of the night because I just felt God prompt me to, to create a moment where we will pray for people that need help in the situation I'm speaking about. We're gonna, at the end of the service, allow five minutes extra. At the end of my time, I'll finish sooner so that we can create an atmosphere of worship so that some of you can seal something in response to what I'm speaking about that means that there's something that just is the lair that is like a lid on the situation that you've been struggling with so that we send people out tonight with a sense of a God kiss on a decision you're making, on, a, on, a, on a something inside maybe you as a couple that you're gonna come to an agreement about, as a family, as a young person. I want a lot of our young people to listen up tonight because there's some of this that you need to really decide upon this evening. And so I am talking to you tonight on the subject I began this morning. And if you like titles for messages, the title for this message is The Prison of Indecision. Turn to the person next to you and say, that would not be you. <laughs> but it probably is. The prison of indecision. I want to identify an area where so many of us get stuck, sometimes for weeks, but oftentimes, sadly, we can get stuck for years of our life and we are blaming all the wrong things. We are saying the reason we are stuck is because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. The reason we can't get out of debt is because of the problems we have financially that don't ever seem to go away. The reason why our marriage is so terrible is because it's all her fault or it's all his fault. The reason why our family can't seem to get a step up is because my family before me never took a step up and we begin to blame all of the things around us but I want you to be really honest with yourself tonight because that's the only way that you're going to see change and I want you to ask yourself is it actually all of the circumstances fault or have you inside the circumstances got stuck I'm going to ask Isaac to come up and join me to illustrate what I mean because if this platform was the story of your life if this platform was your marriage and your family and maybe a crisis that you are facing, if this platform was all of the circumstances that you are in, what indecision does is it places you in a contained space inside your life. What, do, what indecision does is it, it's inside all of these things that are going wrong, you become this person that gets stuck inside these four walls of containment saying, it's just the way it is, it's never gonna change, I can't see a way out. And you begin to get inside of here and now you become shy of making a decision about what you're facing, you freeze on the inside. And so now you might be look like you're moving in your life, but the fact is because you're not making any decisions about your life, all your movement is just recircling the same problems. So it looks like this, your marriage is stuck. But because you won't make a decision to go get help 
for your marriage or admit you're in trouble. You stay in a prison of indecision and though you're moving in your marriage and though you're doing life together, the fact is nothing is changing. And you begin to say, well, it's because of that circumstance and it's because of this. And if we had that, it would be different. But the truth is you have locked your life down because you won't make any decisions about the things that you are facing or dealing with. You live with the dysfunctional teenager or young person in your home. And you say, well, all teenagers are like that. It's just a season we're going through and the dysfunction is just what we have to live with. And so I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to put myself in the prison called indecision and we'll just see what happens. And so you carry on living your life and the arguments get worse and the situation gets more and more out of control and you are moving around furniture in your life and in your relationship, but nothing has happened to change the situation because you refuse to make a decision. I want you to be honest about your life tonight. And I want to ask you, is it their fault? Is it her fault? Is it really his fault? Is it really the addiction fault? Is it really the neighbor's fault? Is it really the family history fault? Or have you inside of all of that circumstance gone somewhere inside yourself, locked your life down and become someone that is your own prisoner because you will not make a decision about things that simply need a decision made about? You can come out of your prison. I want to help you this evening to get out of your prison, to free yourself by making decisions, by understanding the power that you have to make a decision. The Bible says it so clearly in Deuteronomy 30. I love these verses. It's like they're written to let us know, guys, it's really not that difficult. The Bible puts it this way. Look, what I'm commanding of you is not too difficult. This is the Bible saying this. It's not too hard for you. It's not beyond your reach. What I'm asking from you is not up in heaven, so you have to go get it. It's not across the oceans, so you think, how will I ever access it? No, no, no. What I'm asking for you is to make a choice. See, I've set before you life and death, prosperity and destruction. And so I'm asking you to make a decision and I'm suggesting that you would make a decision and I hope and pray that you will choose life. In other words, the Bible's saying, I need you to make a choice. I need you to understand that in your life, you cannot live your life as a puppet to your circumstances. That actually, if you're going to lead your life forward, if you're going to move your life forward, if you're going to have a better life, you're going to have to make decisions. Everyone say decisions. Decisions. Have you ever been out with anyone that cannot make a blooming decision? Drives you crazy. What do you want to do today? I don't know. What do you want to eat? I don't know. Well, well, do you think we should go to a movie? Maybe. Well, what movie would you like to see? I don't know. What do you want to see? Uh! You're like, make your mind up about something. But the fact is when you can't make a decision about small things, they might not affect your destiny. But when you can't make the same decisions about big things, you are in trouble. When you can't decide whether you should cut the relationship off, when you can't decide whether you should get out of debt, when you can't decide whether you've had one drink too many, when you can't decide whether you should not raise your hand to your wife, when you won't make a decision about the way you speak to your children, we are in trouble and you can't blame circumstances anymore. You have to understand, no, you must choose life or death, but choose something. See, we got to lift our level of decision-making in the church. We have got to become those that are more mature and more understanding of the decisions that we need to be making because we need a generation around us and those that are looking to us to not see with the church. We are wishy-washy and we can't make our mind up about anything. You know, right now in America, the people that the campaigners are going after, it's one group of people. It is called the indecided voter. 
They are who they are targeting. They are who they are marketing. They are who they are campaigning for. They're not bothered about the ones that made a decision. They can't mess with them. But they can mess with the minds of the ones that are indecided. And it's exactly the same in your life. The areas where you won't make a decision, the enemy will happily make one for you. The areas where you won't make a decision, young people, your teenage friends will make one for you. When you won't make a decision when the boy says, hey, why don't we have sex? You know what? He'll make the decision for you. You've got to make decisions in your life or someone else will decide for you. And the church should not be the ones that are shy of making a decision. We should not be the place where all you hear are maybe, might, not sure, can't say, possibly, I'll think about it. We should not be the people that are temporal, not sure, nervous, double-minded. We go round and round the circumstances so many times because no one dare say or make a decision. The fact is, we will all make a poor decision. We will. We're all going to make a decision that's not the right one but you can't live in fear of making the wrong decision. Just get on making them because one day you might make a wrong one, but one day you're going to make a right one. And the more decision making you go through, the more you're going to get used to making good decisions. And so we have to get back out of this prison that so many of us live in of indecision, undecided about things in our life, undecided about situations we handle, never changing because we say the change has to come from somewhere else when actually you have the key to change your circumstance. The lock is on the inside. Why do we live in indecision? Well, a lot of us live in indecision because we have a fear of failure. Well, I'm frightened. I make that decision and it goes wrong. I'm going to look a failure. In fact, they say in business that the more successful someone is, the less they like to make decisions because now I have more to lose. I have more to risk. Now, if I make a decision and I'm a senior executive level and the decision is wrong, look at all the people that will be exposed to my poor decision making. And so we procrastinate and we say it'll do and we live at the level that we have managed to get to. But I just feel God saying, is that where you want to live for the rest of your life? Is that it? You want to live in the same place, in the same conversations, with the same company? You you don't want to stretch further, believe for more? Well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to make decisions. Decisions that will upset the comfort that so many of us have got used to living in. Decisions that will rock the boat instead of steady the boat. We allow fear to freeze our future. And some of you, your future is frozen and you have the power to defrost it tonight by making some decisions. The prodigal made some bad decisions. He made bad decisions. A decision to squander his wealth, a decision to be with wild people, a decision to live wild. But you know what? For all the bad decisions he made, he came to a point where he started to make good decisions. And then he made a good decision to go home. He made a good decision to ask for forgiveness. He made a good decision to restore his relationship. In other words, it doesn't matter if you've made bad decisions. God can still help you make good decisions. If you've got failed decisions in your background, don't let them be the reason why you don't move into the foreground of your future. Allow God to direct you, but He cannot direct you if you will not move. Jonah made a bad decision. God sent a whale to help him out in his re-decision. And it was not until he made a new decision that he got out of the whale. Some of you are in a whale. You don't like the whale. The whale smells. You want to be out of it. The only way you're going to get out of the whale is making a decision. And when Jonah said, I'm going to Nineveh, the whale went spew. Jonah was thrown out because he made a decision. Many of us, we won't make a decision because we are paralyzed by our past. We are paralyzed by people. We don't want to upset anyone. Well, if I decide to join that church, if I decide to serve on that team, if I decide to go to a life group when my friends don't go to a life group, if I decide to give my money to the church, what will my friends think about me? They'll think I've lost my mind. And so we don't make any decisions because we are too bothered about what everybody else thinks. Paralyzed. 
So you're like, God, bless my finances, but I can't give because what will people think? God's like, I'm sorry, your indecision has paralyzed my ability to help you. I, I, I want to live a life on fire for you, God, but I'm paralyzed by what will my friends at school think? And so your indecision means that you don't get the place that God wants you. You don't get the dream that God had for you because I don't want to upset anyone. And so indecision becomes something because of our paralyzing of our past, our relationships, our people around us. Do not become a prisoner to situations that God has asked you to be an architect of. Sometimes our indecision, if we're honest, and you have to be really honest, is because you're a control freak. You won't make a decision because you need to control the outcome. And if I make that decision, there's too many things that I can't control right now. And so until everything is controllable, which by the way, you will never be in a place where everything is controllable because people change their mind, situations happen, the wind blows in different directions. And so you can't live your life where you're like, I have to control every element before I'll make a decision. You can't. And so some of your control freak tendencies keep you inside this prison because at least you can contain everything in the prison. At least you can control the way that it looks inside the prison. But God did not call you to live your life that way. Imagine if you were indecisive as a person and today was the day that Jesus came by your life. Jesus was looking for decisive disciples. You know how I know that? Because he said, follow me and kept moving. You did not have time to be indecisive. You come, oh, I'm not sure. Oh, I don't know. I need to phone a friend. I need to speak to a few more people. Jesus was moving as he said it. Follow me. In other words, I'm checking. Can you make a decision? Can you go with your gut? Can you make a decision? Can you follow me in this instant? And those that could not. Those that came to Jesus and said, yeah, but what about this and what about that? Jesus said, go home. Go home. I I don't want to put that on you. I don't want you to live in this place where you feel I've dragged you to something. I need those that can make a decision and move forward. He wanted to train his disciples to be decision-making leaders. How do you think they got so much done in three years of public ministry? They got it by not having meetings of indecision after indecision, but they got it by doing stuff making a call and going for it. Even if it was a dumb call or even if the call didn't work out, Peter made a decision to step out of a boat and stand on water. He didn't last for very long, but at least he made a decision. Hello. Some of you, what if I sink? But what if you don't? What if I sink? Well, if you sink, you had a few moments on the water. If you sink, you have a great story to tell about why you sank. If you sink, maybe the hand of God will be able to grab you and rescue you. And you will have a testimony that no one in the boat had. Make a decision and go with it. We have to become those that are more courageous, more in love with our future than we are married to our past, more committed to stepping out of the boat than we are keeping the boat tidy. And so I want to give you some keys If you are an indecisive person, I had to laugh because on the way to church today, I could not decide what to wear. I got all my clothes out on the floor. I posted on Instagram the the irony of me preaching on decisiveness and I can't even decide what to wear. If you are someone that is struggling with indecision in areas of your life about your future, about your marriage, about relationships, let me give you three tips of how to make good decisions, how to become more decisive as a person. And I'm going to take it from the disciples because they learned from Jesus how to make decisions. They discerned this is a good thing. This is not good. They discern this is a time waster. This is not a time waster. They discern this person is genuine. This person is not. They discerned you're religious, but you're real. They discerned because they knew how to make decisions. And so after being with Jesus, now they're on their own. And Jesus knew, I need you to make decisions because one day I won't be here to make it for you. I'm going to need you to be able to make this all by yourself. And so people would come to them for decisions about their life and about their future and about what they were to do. And in this particular instance in Acts 6, people came to them because there was a problem. The problem was that 
there was too many people and not enough staff and there was lots of people that needed feeding and lots of widows that needed taking care of and there was complaints going around that they weren't being taken care of properly and so they came to the decision makers in their moment of stress and it says in Acts 6 they came and it says in those days the number of disciples was increasing and the Hellenistic Jews amongst them were complaining against the Hebraic Jews because the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. They had a problem. They had a circumstance. They had whinging. They had whining. They had moaning. Anybody ever been in a scenario like that? Hello. Anyone live in a scenario like that? Complaints, arguments, tension, stress, not really sure where the answer is. And they come to the disciples and this is what the disciples do. I love it. The first response seems crazy, but there's such wisdom in their first response. It says this, so the 12, after hearing all the stress, all the commotion, all the problems, all the arguing, the 12 gathered and this is what they said. Well, it's not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word to wait on tables. Hang on a minute. How is that an answer to this problem? You're not going to sit with the complainers. You're not going to talk to the people that are upset. You're not going to counsel with the widows that feel they've been overlooked. You're not going to go around and interview everyone about where the shortage of food situation is going on. They don't do any of that. You know what they do? They let their decisions guide the indecision. And that's what I want you to take away. I want you to understand the first thing that you need to learn is that there are decisions that you must make as a person, decisions that are core values for your life. And in times where there is confusion and lots of indecision, let your decisions guide the indecision. In other words, they were like, okay, I know there is an expectation that we solve this problem. I know that people are gonna say, why don't you help wait on tables? I know that we're gonna get asked to roll our sleeves up and do the job to prove that we care. But their first response was, our job is not to wait on tables. Our job, the decision of our destiny is to preach the word of God. Therefore, that will be the main decision that guides the next decision. Here's what it looks like in your life. Your marriage is rubbish right now. It's hard, you don't like each other, you're not getting along, you argue more than you agree, there's tension in the home, you can't seem to move forward, you feel trapped in that marriage. You feel stress, you feel all of the tensions that are going on, but here's what you come down to. I made a decision to marry you. And I said, at the end of an altar, till death is due part. And I said, in sickness and in health. And I said, in good times and in bad times. And I made a decision. And so in this season of lots of indecision, I go back to the decision I made to steer my other decisions. When I first married Steve, I have to tell you and be really honest with you, The first couple of years of marriage were more like hell than heaven. I did not like the man I married. I don't know what happened between the wedding and the real marriage. I don't know what like took over. There was like a body transformation happened and this Prince Charming suddenly didn't pick up his socks and didn't seem to know that there was an expectation in my mind of how he was supposed to behave. And there was a list and a criteria that I was sure he'd seen before we got into this deal. Did you not know I need breakfast in bed? Did you not know I need flowers once a week? Did you not know I need dating on a regular occasion? Did you not know that I need to be told these things and affirmed as a woman? And when those things didn't happen, I would get mad and then problems would happen, which would make me more mad. And I know that I obviously was not fault. I mean, it was not my fault. I had done nothing wrong. And we would argue and we would fight. And it was miserable. And I remember one day, we were about married about 18 months. I remember saying, that is it. And I went and got a suitcase. And I packed that suitcase in front of him. And I put those clothes in with a passion. And I got that suitcase and I shut the suitcase up. And I said, I don't care what the church thinks. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care anymore. I am out of here. I don't like you. I don't want to be in the same house as you. And I know you can't believe that I would be that mean, but I was. 
And I remember getting the car keys and I said, it is finished. And I used the D word, we are getting a divorce. I got in the car and I drove off. I have no idea where I was going. I had no money with me. As I drove down the, dra- drove down the road about a mile, I'm thinking, how dumb was I? I've left him the house. <laughs> Wait a minute, I got a car. It's not even a good car. He got the house. This was a, I didn't even bring my right clothes. I don't even have my wallet with me. And I was like, this is a disaster. And so I drove and I drove and I tried to like be away from the house long enough to convince him that I was serious, but I was cold and I was hungry and I wanted to watch TV. And, and I was like, I really want to go home now, but now I'm embarrassed because I've only been gone half an hour. And I said I was leaving him forever. And I remember all this crazy scenario playing out. And then I came to my senses. And I'm like, seriously, what am I doing? I made a decision, and today I don't like him, but maybe tomorrow I can work on loving him. Maybe tomorrow we can work on our marriage. Maybe tomorrow we can allow, we've made a decision, allow these areas of difficulty and stress to be made a decision through our decision. I'm not talking about if your marriage is one of domestic violence or your marriage is one where there's someone that has multiple affairs and cheats on you. I'm not talking about that. There are grounds in the Bible for separating. There are grounds where you shouldn't be walked all over or treated like a punch bag. There are grounds that we biblically believe we can stand with you on. But I'm talking about when you just don't like each other. I'm talking about when you're just having a bad week, month or year. I'm talking about actually when you are being mean and you know you're being mean, but you don't want to admit it. I'm talking about when you've been selfish and actually you need to die to self and embrace the journey you're on. And I stand here, 24 years we have been together, more in love than I've ever been with that man that I packed my bags on. And I thank God that I allowed a decision I made to steer me in my indecision. Some of you married couples in here, stop using the D word. It is off bounds. You've made a decision. Make a decision and now work it out. Work it out. You'd say the same to you. If your kids came, I'm off on one now. If your kids came and said, Mom, I don't like school. I don't like school. I don't want to go anymore. But babe, you're 12. You have to go to school. Yeah, but I don't like school. I don't like the teachers. I don't like my teachers. I don't want to go anymore. You would not say to your kids, oh, that's fine. It's no big deal. Just quit school. Just stay home. No big deal. I'll have you home all day. You can be bumming around the house all day doing nothing in your pajamas. I don't need you to grow up and be a mature, reasonable, sensible adult. I don't mind. You know, you would not say that. You would say to your kids, I'm sorry you don't like school, but you're 12. Get to school. Right? But when we're adults, somehow we justify our immature behavior. I want to say to some of you married people, you made a decision. Suck it up and make a decision to make it better. Make it better. Make it better. Made a decision to have kids. You can't send them back once you've had them. You made your decision. You're stuck with them. I'm sorry, they don't come with a return to sender post bag. I have checked on several occasions, but they don't. You can't send them back. You're stuck with them. So you're going to have to allow your decision to have them. Hello. Guide the moments of indecision you have about them. I made a decision years ago that I would be in church. Whether it was a Sunday with the songs I liked, whether it was a Sunday with the preaching I liked, whether people were nice to me or not nice to me, my responsibility that I made, my commitment I made was I am deciding to be in church. Tells me in my Bible, planted in the house. I'm making a decision. So whether I felt like going to church or not. And guess what? Newsflash. There are some Sundays. I'm the pastor. I don't want to come to church. I don't. I want to stay in bed, feel sorry for myself, eat popcorn and watch a movie. But I gave up the right to that moment of indecision because I made a decision. Hello. In moments of indecision, unclarity, pressure, go back to the decisions that are fundamental for your future. We made a decision to be generous. We've made a decision to tithe. Whether we feel like it or not, we have made a decision. What are you making a decision about? Joshua said, as for me and my house, we made a decision. I've made a decision that our kids are coming to church until they are old enough to make the decision for themselves. Then they can decide. But right now, you're 10. 
we're going to church. I don't want to. I want to play on my PlayStation. Tough. You're going to church. Yeah, but I, it's not fair. Tough. You're going to church. Hello. I've made a decision that will guide your indecision. But some of you, you live your life at the beck and call of whatever anybody decides on that given day. And then you wonder why there is no consistency in your marriage, in your parenting, and in your family. The disciples answered the problem with that statement. It's not right for us to neglect what we're called to do to wait on tables. Let your decision guide your indecision. It then goes on to say this, that then the next thing they did was they went and gathered the brothers and sisters and they said this to them, go choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we're gonna turn this responsibility over to them and then we're gonna give attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. In other words, the second thing I want you to learn is that you need to learn how to decide, not in leaps, but in steps. The reason why many of us don't make decisions is because it seems so hard. Well, it's such a big decision. I, you know, I, I'm not really sure where to start. I feel confused. No, no, break it down. Take steps, not leaps. They said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to choose some people. They're going to go find the people. Then when they find the people, we're going to look at the people, then we're going to pray about the situation. In other words, we're breaking down the problem and getting others involved in helping us make a good decision. Zacchaeus made a decision. I'm going to get out of bed today. Next decision. I'm going to go see that Jesus bloke. Next decision. I can't see, so I'm going to climb a tree. Next decision, Jesus is at the bottom of the tree, I'm going to come down. Next decision, I'm going to have Jesus over for dinner. And then finally, as he sat with Jesus in front of him, he makes the biggest decision of all, which is, I need to get my life right, and then decides to pay everybody back what he owes them. He did not wake up that morning and say, how in the world do I right my wrongs? Because he wouldn't have had a clue. But the step by step by step took him to a place where he was able to make the big decision. Hello. So make some small decisions to help you make the bigger decisions. Make some calls now. I'm in debt. We owe thousands of pounds. We are so drowning in debt. Okay. I can't solve your debt overnight. But here's a step. Stop using your credit card. Hello, here's a step, stop buying things for Christmas that you don't need. Here's a step, stop living beyond your means. Here's a step, go get debt counseling for your family. Here's a step, learn how to use money better and manage money differently. Here's a step, set up a savings plan for your life. In other words, break it down and get out of your prison. But we stay in the prison because we go, it's just too big and it's just too scary and I'll never be able to solve my marriage and I'll never be able to get it back and I'll never be able to fix it. And so I'm just going to stay in this prison of indecision. No, get out and say, today I'm going to call someone and get help. And then I'm going to ask for someone to come alongside. Then I'm going to open up my situation to someone else. And finally, I told you I'd get there. It says after they'd broken it down, the band can come up and we're going to pray in a moment. After it broken it down and they got wisdom from the team and those around them, it says they brought these people to the disciples. It says the proposal that they made, the suggestion they made, this pleased the whole group. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, and they listed all the people they chose. And it says they presented him to the men, to the apostles. And then this is what they did. Then they prayed and they laid hands on them. And that's what I want to end this service by doing. Because I believe the third thing that we have in our arsenal that many people don't have in theirs that are not believers, we have the God factor. We have the Spirit of God factor. And so when we make our decision, even if we're unsure, we have something we can do in that moment of uncertainty. It's called prayer. It's called devote it to God. You know, indecision is best met with intercession. You intercede over your decision. You say, God, I'm not sure if this is the right call, but I'm going to try. So God, I devote it to you. God, guide me if it's wrong. God, I'm not sure, but I think this is what I should do. Some of you don't pray at all about the areas that need the most prayer. 
Pray over the decision. Pray over. Like Rich said tonight, you've decided to give, so pray over it. You've decided to commit, so pray over it. They prayed and they sealed the decision they've made. And I was reading in James where it talks so much about indecision. And it says in James 1 verse 2 in the Amplified this, it says, if any of you lack the wisdom to guide you through a decision, if any of you lack the wisdom to guide you in your choice of circumstance, then you are to ask our benevolent God because He will give to everyone generously without rebuke or blame and it will be given to Him. But He must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts, the one who's indecided, they're like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wave. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything at all because he is double-minded, unstable, and restless in everything he thinks, feels, or decides. If any of you lacks wisdom about the decisions you're making, bring your decision and present it to God and then say, God, I need your help with this. You know, there's a story in the Bible about Paul and Paul is talking to some people and they were expecting him to come because he'd made a decision to come and see them and then they began to accuse him of being indecisive. He says this, he says, are you going to accuse me of being flipped with my promises because I didn't come? Do you think I talk out of both sides of my mouth? A glib yes one moment and a glib no the next. Well, you're wrong. I try to be as true to my word as God is to His. I try to be. Our word to you isn't a careless yes cancelled by an indifferent no. How could it be? When Silas and Timothy and I proclaimed the Son of God among you, did you pick up on any yes or no, on and off again, waffling? No, it was clean and it was strong. It was a yes. Whatever God has promised, get stamped with the yes of Jesus in Him. This is what we preach. This is what we pray. The great amen. God's yes and our yes together, gloriously evident. God affirms us, making us a sure thing in Christ, putting His yes within us by His Spirit. He has stamped us with the eternal pledge, a sure beginning of what He is destined to complete. God is not in two minds indecisive about you. He's put His yes stamp on you. He is for you. But I love this next bit because it's like they prayed. They said they were going to visit the church twice and they didn't visit them twice. And he says, so let me just sum up by saying this, Paul says. Now, are you ready for the real reason I didn't visit you in Corinth? As God is my witness, the only reason I didn't come to you was to spare you pain. I was being considerate of you, not indifferent, not manipulative. We're not in charge of how you live out the faith looking over your shoulders, being critical of you, but were partners alongside you. In other words, they thought they were making a decision to go visit, but then they sought God, they prayed, and then they felt a conviction, we probably shouldn't go on this occasion. And they altered their course. God will alter your course when you submit your course to Him. But if you are locked in a prison, God cannot alter anything because you're not even moving. You're just stuck. And some of you, you're like, but my marriage is disaster. Okay, it's a disaster. So what? I can, I could introduce you to 10, 20, 12 couples in this room that were there where you were. Maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. It was a disaster for them too, but they're here. Their marriage is restored. Why? Because they made a decision. They weren't sure it was the right one, but they prayed. And God began to guide them. Don't do this. Do this. Say that. Don't say that. And I want to end this service, like I said at the beginning, just to give just five, six minutes of time. Because some of you, I believe, you know, I pray. We all pray before we preach. I pray every time I'm preparing for our house. God, what do they need this week? I'm responsible to feed your kids this week. What do I need to put on the plate this week? And I felt God give me this message. I don't know who it's for, but I know it's for someone. You're about to make a really dumb choice. And I'm here to rescue you and say, think again, allow God into the process, allow God's counsel, allow His wisdom. Do not live in that prison you've created for yourself. Hey, I'm so glad that we had this time together. And now we are praying that you get busy 
following Jesus, making a difference in your world. And we want to invite you. Come visit us in one of our four campuses, Bradford, Leeds, Belfast, or Warsaw, Poland. And we would love to see you soon. Charlotte Gamble's latest book helps us to find perspective in the tough seasons of life. It talks about wisdom in the weariness, strength for the struggles, more passion to persist and joy for the journey of life. Engaging, personal and full of biblical truth and wisdom. To purchase this book or discover more resources, visit her website charlottegamble.com.